chilling tales for dark nights. Dead Time, written by Jael Pinto, narrated by Jonathan Jones. Have you ever heard of sleep paralysis? Sleep paralysis is a condition that causes people to be unable to move either when falling asleep or waking up. It is often accompanied by night terrors and particularly vivid nightmares all of which can be more than a little disturbing when you find yourself at your most vulnerable and unable to react. Its physical causes remain a mystery, but the condition is sometimes directly related to psychological factors such as built-up stress. I suppose it shouldn't have been much of a surprise that the torment that haunted my early teenage years returned when I moved to a rundown suburban neighborhood in Louisiana. The block I lived on was a textbook example of the frenzied building of the late 90s that led to the subsequent housing crisis. Prices plummeted quickly when the builders realized no one wanted to live near a bog, miles away from any major city. To me, however, it was perfect. Being a web designer meant I could work from home, and although it took a while to get used to using mosquito nets, the house, for its asking price, was a real bargain and included a porch, a garage, and even a space in the attic that I planned to transform into a home theater and game room. It also allowed me to set my studio and bedroom apart and provided me with extra space if friends wanted to drop by. Fresh out of college and ready to get on with working, it promised to be everything I could wish for, except that it had been so poorly maintained. I'm not talking about superficial, easy to fix stuff. Either the soggy paint and weed-infested porch I could take care of myself, but the multiple leaks and crackling wiring represented a whole different sort of beast. Fortunately, my parents came over and some really nice neighbors volunteered to help, probably happy to see a fresh face amongst the row of empty houses. Even the local pastor came by, a chubby little man who served ours and three other equally deserted parishes and did his best to keep the small, nearby church from falling into ruin. By the end of the month, my home looked as gorgeous as it could ever be. After several weeks of continuous home repairs and working at my computer, both almost non-stop, and in spite of the clearly friendly, welcoming community, the stress and exhaustion hit me hard. The first night it happened, I woke up in a sweat, as if startled by a distant scream that faded away the moment I regained consciousness. Trying to switch on the light, I found my arm immobilized, buried beneath a tide of blankets that might as well have been made of lead, trapping all my limbs beneath its crushing embrace. I sighed. Not this again. You know that Henry Fuseli painting that depicts a young maiden laying on her bed with a fat, piggish imp sitting over her? The nightmare, I think it's what it's called? That's what this felt like. A nightmare that's absolutely terrifying as it hits you before you have any idea what's going on. However, I was already what you might call a veteran at this stuff, and as soon as I recognized it for what it was, I tried my best to go back to sleep before I wasted an hour looking at the ceiling wishing I could go back to sleep. I tried counting sheep, trying to mentally solve complex math while forgetting half the numbers, you know, the usual tricks. At last, after a relentless battle, I finally fell into a listless slumber and woke up just as tired as I had been when I laid down. One of the things that makes each sleep paralysis condition unique is its frequency. The luckier of those afflicted will suffer from the condition only once and are then free from it for the rest of their lives, while others, it's a monthly occurrence. My case is fairly peculiar in that it rarely raises its ugly head, but when it does, it comes on full force, in strings of consecutive episodes spanning weeks. Well acquainted with the pattern, I expected another restless night. One of the few productive things I did that day was tilting my window blind slightly so I would be able to spy the magnificent view of chipped paint and overgrown bushes that filled the horizon. All humor aside, this was a trick I'd come up with as a teen. It helped me to cope with my problem. Poster-worthy or not, 
any view during one of my nighttime episodes was better than complete blackness. And being an early riser by nature, the morning sun wouldn't bother me at all. Nothing unusual happened that night, and I was relieved to wake up refreshed and ready to make up for everything I should have done the day before. Still, I was experienced enough to know that one good night didn't mean the cycle was over. I was careful to not overwork myself. I figured there was a good chance I'd need to conserve some strength. The paralysis did, however, return. As certain as nighttime itself, so there I was again frozen in my bed, at least this time with enough light in the room to be able to see exactly what time it was. The clock read 3.32 a.m. Not a pleasant surprise, but things could have been worse. The faster I fell back to sleep, I thought, the more rested I'd feel in the morning. Between the blinds, I watched as streetlights projected yellow shapes onto the dirty white walls of the nearby houses, giving ghoulish life to swaying tree branches. I was moments from closing my eyes when something else caught my attention. It was a silhouette of a man or a woman, I couldn't tell, making its way through our empty streets in the dead of night. I remember thinking how odd it was for someone to be out this late, particularly an elderly person as the heavy, limping stride seemed to indicate. Although I am not typically the type to stick my nose in other people's business, I couldn't help but spy on this figure as it passed. I had nothing better to do, was unable to move, and knew too well that my night's slumber was already ruined. In considering the state my own home had been in when I bought it, it wouldn't have come as any surprise to me if someone was out there now for the express purpose of looting the vacant, unsold houses. The stranger, however, did nothing out of the ordinary and would have been completely unremarkable if it weren't for the fact it was after 3 a.m and that he was alone and on my street. Slowly shuffling, the shadowy figure made his way through the neighborhood, passing a little too close, I thought, to the front of my house before merging with the night and disappearing from my line of sight again. Maybe I was making too much out of it, I thought. Perhaps it was just some old eccentric, every town's got one, or some drunk rambling around after downing a bottle or two. But my concerns began to grow when the exact same thing happened during my paralysis the next night. After an uneventful day during which I tried to relax and set work aside in order to regain some stability, I woke up this time at exactly 3.22 a.m. I watched the same figure again pass my house before vanishing into the darkness. He, I found myself assuming that it was a he, had to be up to something. I couldn't see his face in the shadows of the streetlights, obscured as it was by what appeared to be a wide-brimmed hat. I tried to remember if any of my neighbors had a limp leg, but no one came to mind. I wasn't surprised, though, and reasoned that I had yet to meet everyone who lived on my street. Much of the population had made themselves scarce, and for all I knew, someone could have fallen and hurt himself in the weeks since the initial flurry of welcome to the neighborhood visits. The day and night that followed went smoothly, without anything worthy of mention. I did ask around, though, as inconspicuously as possible, to see whether anyone knew of someone who resembled the man I saw during the late night crisis. No one had any clue who or what I was talking about. By the end of the day, I feared my neighbors had me pegged as an unhinged lunatic. That night was when I started to notice the stuff that didn't fit with the it's just a limping neighbor theory. As I'd expected, the man returned at his usual hour, went on his usual walk, and took his usual path. Exactly the same path. I mean literally. He stopped to catch his breath near the third house down the road, cocked his head slightly as he crossed the empty asphalt, and then tripped, nearly falling over when he got to the intersection. It was impossible, but I swear that if I had counted his steps, I would have found that he took the exact same number of them every night. As soon as he disappeared, I gasped in shock and brought my hand to my mouth. The sleep paralysis was gone. I got up and went straight to the window, lifting the sash and sticking my head out to see if I could catch a glimpse of the shadow skulking away. Nothing. 
he had disappeared and along with him the invisible force which had held me down. Suffice it to say, I was both intrigued and disturbed by what had happened and was quite certain it hadn't been a nightmare. Sleep was now out of the question. I contemplated calling a friend of mine, a self-professed expert in all things paranormal, but realized it was far too late in the day. As a result, I had just one option left. I jumped online and posted my experience on various paranormal boards, hoping my story would remain visible amidst the countless phony ghost pictures that flooded the forums. My post got a better response than I had expected. Eh, there were the typical trolls who joked about it being Blair Witch 3, but maybe that was why one user suggested to me that I should videotape the evidence and post it to be reviewed by other posters. I didn't know what else to do, so I obliged and the following night my camera was set up, facing towards the street. I started the tape recording at midnight on the dot. Sure enough, the stranger showed up again, and I swear went through exactly the same motions again. When it was over and I was able to get up, still a bit heavy on my legs but surprisingly recovered, the first thing I did was grab the camera to transfer the video hoping to be able to zoom in on the figure and finally see who or what it was. You can imagine my shock when the stranger was nowhere to be seen. I fast forwarded through the whole thing and he simply didn't appear on the video. Nearly five hours of footage of an empty street. That's what I watched. Baffled, I tried to explain my situation on the website and was met with general mockery. However, some of the members insisted I upload the file so they could search it themselves. For anomalies, they said. The results they posted later that evening were bizarre. It seemed that the man had indeed been caught by my camera, but only in a single frame. Somewhere around 3 hours, 22 minutes, and 50 seconds, a human-shaped shadow appeared near one of the streetlights, only to be gone in the next frame. Unnerved, I searched my own video to see if they were ribbing me. No. There it was, exactly 32251. The same blurry silhouette. What I did next, well, why it seemed like a good idea at the time, I'll never know. I guess it was because I was tired and angry at having my nights constantly interrupted. It was now clear this was no normal human being. Despite the warnings of the two or three geeks on the other side of the computer screen that made it sound so easy to deal with, suggesting that it would be better to just wait until the phenomenon subsided or simply move to another home, I decided to stay awake, keep watch outside, and confront the thing. This is precisely what I've been doing for the last two hours, sitting here between the weeds and the bugs and writing this down to document my experience but mostly to keep me busy until it comes, since I don't expect to be disturbed until our usual appointment. September 23rd, 2011, 3.22 AM. I really can't expect anyone to believe what just happened, but please, if you have listened this long, you might as well hear me out and at least take my advice and not follow my footsteps. I've messed up, badly and now I may be about to pay the ultimate price for my recklessness. This waking nightmare has, has this time bonded me not to my bed, but to the horrors I just witnessed. To this moment that, that may well be my last, but I've got to calm down. I have to calm down and try to explain the best way I can what led me to my current situation. <sighs> Otherwise, all my efforts will have been in vain. As I said before, I was hiding on the side of my porch, waiting for the thing to make its move, checking my watch and fumbling with my dad's revolver. Now, I'm not the person who normally resorts to violence, and if I had my way, there would have been no firearms in my new house, but my father gave it to me and insisted I kept it, fearing for my safety while I was living alone in such an isolated area. I had just kept it in a box. Never once did it cross my mind that one day I would have to load it much less use it. My plan was simple. Follow the thing, find out what it was, and scare it away with a few gunshots. In hindsight, the plan was as stupid as they come, but sleep deprivation, outright anger and frustration coupled with the drinks I'd had in order to gain some courage all conspired to make it seem a reasonable idea. 
I started to regret my decision, however, the moment it appeared. Down at the far end of the street, the increasingly familiar black silhouette crept its way out of the shadows, starting its walk along the only path it had ever taken. I checked my clock, and sure enough, it was 3.22.51. I didn't know then, and I can't believe it now. Never mind. I'm getting ahead of myself. <sighs> the man, let's keep calling it that even if I'm still not sure, painstakingly crept past the first few houses on my block, pausing frequently in front of a wooded gate here or holding onto a lamppost there. I checked again. 3.22.51. Hunched as usual, it crossed the street at a snail's pace, head bobbing as if looking around for cars that were nowhere to be seen. Coughing, the haggard figure stopped to hold onto a traffic light. I shivered when my watch reported back. 3.22.51. Down the road and a turn to the right in slow, heavy steps he shambled. I refused to believe it was still 3.22.51. All the bravado I had gathered from the day, internet, and bottle drained away and I found myself skittering back to the front door, desperately trying to force it open so that I could retreat inside and hide in my room. But the knob wouldn't budge. It was as though it had turned to stone. No matter how much strength I put into it, it remained in its original position as if paralyzed. The realization struck me like a sledgehammer. It wasn't just the doorknob. All around me, the usual autumn breezes were dead. Leaves were glued to the ground. Tree branches were as immobile as metal statues of themselves. In the sky, the moon shone steadily between the unmoving clouds, working together with the dim streetlights to cover the stranger in a sickly greenish glow. The form was still approaching and almost upon me. This close, I could see it more clearly. The dark, moth-eaten jacket and pants, the patches of gray, long, uneven hair crowning its features in shadow. But everything else about him seemed blurry, as if coated in a sticky layer of darkness. I edged behind a fence and watched in horror as he passed the front of my house. He seemed to be barefoot and heading towards the dirt road that led to the nearby woods. Even though I was as terrified as I had ever been, I couldn't help it. Curiosity got the better of me. I followed the stranger as he shambled down the last of our street before heading into the wilderness. Half afraid he'd stop me and half even more afraid I could be stuck in this, I don't know what to call it, time freeze? The space between seconds? The moment before you start to inhale? Whatever it was, the being was certainly related to the paralytic phenomenon I'd been experiencing, and now I was in this parallel zone with the creature, whether I wanted to be or not. Together we tiptoed past the empty houses, him leading the way without ever stopping, me pausing every once in a while to pat the reassuring weight of the revolver in my pocket. In this way, our two-man caravan abandoned civilization and plunged deep into the undergrowth. The hard, cold metal of the gun should have given me at least a small amount of confidence, but the truth is, I was scared shitless. Every time I'd feel a pebble under my shoe or a twig brush against my head, I'd hold my breath, praying that the thing I was following hadn't noticed. Sometimes it would stop, causing me to gag on a scream while I watched it stagger towards some nearby trunk to lean on for a moment only to continue marching into the depths of the gnarled woods. That's when I noticed the silence. Following the being through the tangled and wiry bushes that littered the pathway should have made some noise. Instead, not a single leaf rustled, nor did the undergrowth crumple. While I had every reason to be extra cautious, my quarry didn't seem to bother at all and simply plowed through the foliage like a fog creeping in. He was silent too, and it wasn't just him. No, the wretched thing seemed to have contaminated the world all around us. No cricket, mosquito, or owl dared to break the stillness that froze the air, and I couldn't help but wonder if they were all paralyzed in their nests and burrows as I had been in my bed. A rank, 
putrid stench began to set in as we approached what I suspected to be the nearby swamp. I used to be able to hear the toads as I sat on my balcony during the calm summer nights. There was no croaking this time, but my suspicions as to our location were nevertheless confirmed. Beams of pale green light gleamed on the pools of muddy water, a dark mirror of browns and blacks that might as well have been made of dirty glass. The silence was deathly. No ripple, no frog, no gas bubble disturbed by the water's surface as the stranger stopped and sat at the muddy edge of a pool, almost as if contemplating the sight. His bare feet slumped into the mushy paste of the earth and dried algae without the slightest noise. Under the moonlight, I thought I would be able to see beneath all those baggy and rotten clothes if I snuck just a bit closer. Slowly, I approached the being from behind, half expecting to see toad-like hands and gills carved into its neck, like something out of H.P. Lovecraft tales I used to read in my freshman year. The truth was far simpler and more disturbing than that. I watched as it pulled one of its feet from the muck and water, and with it came the three remaining black and withered toes, the cracked, parchment-like skin peeking out from the muddy residue. I let out a gasp and staggered away in shock, trying to put as much distance as possible between me and that, that carcass of a man that I had watched walking down my street night after night. As I stared, unable to take my eyes from it, the rotten monstrosity turned its head to face me. It looked at me, with one eye hanging from its socket, its bloated face obscured by its matted hair. Its mouth opened and it gurgled at me, as though commanding my ears to hear his voice. Open wounds and exposed skull now visible and glistening at me under the moonlight sent the contents of my stomach back to my throat and filled my mouth with searing acid. Without a second glance, I darted off to the woods, spitting vomit as I ran and silently swearing as I slammed blindly against trunks and branches. The sharp iron-like limbs and leaves scraped against my face and I ducked my head to keep my eyes safe until I bumped into something heavy and wet and was knocked to the ground. Scrambling, I tried to scurry away from whatever I'd just run into, but my leg got caught on something and I panicked. It only took a moment to see the situation for what it really was. I wasn't caught. My leg was being pinned to the ground. I dropped the gun twice before finally being able to retrieve it and point it at whatever was holding me down. On the other side of my barrel's sight, I met the yellowish gaze of a woman hanging from a nearby tree, staring at me with bulging eyes covered by the same layer of pus and blood that enveloped the rest of her twitching body a body just long enough for her feet to hold my legs down. All around in the depths of the small forest I could see now that other things also crawled around, things far too thin and ragged to be alive. The air was filled with the pungent stench of death. I had to get out of there. Gritting my teeth and rolling away from the thrashing legs of the corpse hanging over me, I held my gun close and rushed towards a dim yellow light I could barely see shining in the distance, ignoring the skinless fingers that dug through the undergrowth and the dripping entrails of another disturbing silhouette impaled on one of the higher branches. I emerged from the woods and found myself in an unfamiliar section of my suburb. The street lights brought yet more horrors, and I had to force myself to keep running. I darted past a man inside the metal cage of what had once been a totaled vehicle, as he desperately tried to claw his way out of his final resting place. He banged on invisible glass and a non-existent metal frame while yelling to me to save him from the flames, throwing himself repeatedly against barriers that were no longer there. Though I tried, I could not avoid looking at his face, and ran off likewise pretending to ignore the jumbled mass of broken bones and leftover limbs twisted into impossible angles that inched sickeningly across the sidewalk. Others kept to the shadows, skulking on street corners or behind the veil of dark doorways, just far enough to be out of sight but close enough for me to hear the slowly increasing sound of footsteps all around me. I kept going, but to where was I running? Returning home was the first thing that came to my mind, but now I could see just how stupid the idea was. Even if I got there, what use would that be if the doors were still frozen, 
until the paralysis caused by the apparent rift in space and time, if that was what it was, let up. There was no reason to try to find shelter indoors since I wouldn't be able to close the doors again on this unholy mass. Unless… the church! I was never a superstitious man, but then I hadn't met any walking corpses before, and from some of the tales I'd read, I remembered that the living dead couldn't walk on holy ground, and that would include everything within the high iron fences surrounding the little parish church, right? Anyway, it, it was better than doing nothing. At the very least, I could buy myself some time to plan my next step. Shadows shuffled in my peripheral vision as I made it across the second intersection, stopping to take a glance inside one of the few cars parked outdoors in the irrational hope that owners could have left the key inside, and that I could open the door and start it, but the glass only reflected a vision of hell. Looming behind me were dozens of rotting heads staring with unblinking eyes, their mouths agape. Without turning back, I jolted left, only to come face to face with a man in a blood-smeared jacket who looked at me with an almost childlike expression on his ruined face. Without a single thought, I jumped on top of the vehicle, grateful that the windshield held, and cursed myself for having wasted my time. I would have never been able to break in anyway. Leaping off the car's hood and racing towards the final intersection that stood between me and Sanctuary, my heart pounded in my chest as the ghostly crowd took up the chase, the thumping of their feet ever closer, following my own inaudible footsteps. As I turned right, despair overwhelmed me. The far end of the road just before the church vomited a new crawling mass at me, effectively cutting off my best route. With the first horde still hot on my heels, I had no choice but to continue forward, towards the shambling army that awaited me, or so they hoped. A front yard came into view, which, like the churchyard, was circled by an iron fence topped with spikes. I didn't hesitate to try and climb it. Corpses weren't known for their agility, but unfortunately neither was I, and I managed only to fall flat on the ground when my grip slipped. Before I could get up, a horrible pain shot through my legs as if icicles had punctured them, and before I could kick away, more ice-cold vices gripped my right arm. Rolling my head to see what had me trapped, I witnessed the moving face of a woman, with no lips nor gums left in her jaws whispering at me. She dug her cold, wet fingers into my neck. I tried to punch and kick, but could barely move as more and more bony arms pinned my legs and body to the concrete. I still had one hand free and used it to do what any sane man would have done long ago. I raised my gun. Instantly, some of my assailants backed away, one of them clutching the dry and visible holes in his chest as he did so and I seized the moment to kick myself free of the last of them and unload the revolver, hoping at least the noise and light would scare them away. The gun spurred in only dead air as I felt it ineffectively click through all six of its loaded chambers. I dropped the useless piece of metal as I flung myself again at the fence, this time managing to get to the top unharmed, while the ragged crowd recovered from its confusion and their low gurgles gave way to snarls as they came at me again. Dropping down into the safety of the protected yard, I ran as fast as I could around the side of the backyard and dashed over a much smaller wooded fence just in time to hear my pursuers starting to spill over the porch. Though I was exhausted like I'd never been before, my inner strength was relit by hope. I could see the light of the church. I headed straight for the hill and got back on the main road, ignoring the constant ache of my legs where the icy claws had dug into flesh. The church rose on the horizon and I took one last glimpse back to see the undead horde still struggling to free themselves from the obstacle which I'd led them. Many were stuck half in and half out of the iron fence, with a few stuck up on the upper spikes and no way to catch up to me now. This was it. I knew I could make it. The church was just ahead now, and I could see the lights were on inside. And there were people there, others who had taken shelter beyond the churchyard fence, in the light of the sanctuary. I was right. 
and now everything was going to be okay. I pressed on, telling myself the way the parishioners leaned as they walked was probably because they were as tired as I, caught in the dead of night by this invasion from beyond. I ran, even while trying to convince myself that the gruesome injuries I started to see even from this distance were sustained in their own fights to get into the church. I forced my legs to keep moving while weakly holding out hope that I wasn't alone and had finally found help. But when the headstones of the churchyard cemetery came into view beyond the fence, and with them the scrawny, wraith-like shadows that scurried amongst the tombs, I realized I couldn't keep lying to myself. I hide now in this hollow, having run what I hope to be enough of a distance to put me out of their range, and wonder how long it will take until these things depart, if they ever depart. In the now distant town, the ghouls continue to come and go, occasionally sticking their heads up or sniffing the air. It has been 3 hours, 22 minutes, and 51 seconds for a long while now, just as it was when I began to write my story. I want... No, I need to get the word out, where even though it may not be believed, it will at least be heard and serve as a warning. There are things that go bump in the night, and there is a real risk of venturing too deep into the abyss to be able to return to life. If you wake up paralyzed in the middle of the night, consider perhaps that there is a very good reason why you are unable to move. Just please, never ever try to leave the bed.